be a mistake. And you've been having fun as much as you are also feeding and feasting on the Word of God. All right. And we got off to a start earlier this morning, all right, as we dealt with two lessons all right, from Ruth chapter 1. Okay, so... All right, so what we're going to do is let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. All right, and we'll look at verse 14 to 17 because when we w got into Ruth chapter 1 and when you get to the end when Ruth finally makes the decision to, uh, uh, sorry, Naomi makes the decision to move back to Israel, all right, and to go back home, um, there was something very fundamental that changed, right? The whole trip, the whole journey there had changed her. The time that she had spent away changed her. And this was reflected in the name that she, she decided to call herself. She picked the name that best describes herself, Mara. It's no longer mid Naomi, which meant what, delightful or pleasant. Now she describes herself as bitter because this is what she is this is who she's become and so tonight before we kind of, I wanted to actually move on to chapter 2 but before we could do that we need to spend some time to understand this issue of bitterness because um, which is the whole theme of the, the camp right from bitterness to blessedness and so we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12 and I, I want us to look at these verses Okay, chapter 12, verse uh, 14 to 17. And so let's all stand and we will read this together. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to read this together and. Let's do this. Uh, yeah, we'll just read all this together in unison. Just follow after me, right? Follow peace with all men and holiness with which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright for ye know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Father, we thank you, Lord, for even this afternoon, for the fun and games that we were able to have, for the food we've been able to, the good food that we've been able to enjoy so far. And uh, Lord, uh, even the time of uh, worship, and uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, that we can praise you even in song. And right now, as we come to this text, Lord, we ask that not only you bless the reading of your word, but also the teaching and preaching of your word. I pray and ask that for everyone's hearts here to be tender, just ready to receive your word. And Lord, I pray and ask for you to give me wisdom, understanding, fill me thy spirit and power that I will be an effective minister. And Lord, you know the needs. You know what is in everyone's hearts. And I prayed and asked, Lord, that you use me to be of a help and a strong encouragement to everyone here. And Lord, stir our hearts tonight. And we will cooperate by yielding and be ready, being ready, ready to hear what you have to say and ready to respond. And we thank you. Lord, have your way with us in Christ's name, pray. Amen. Please be seated. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 to 17 deals with this issue of bitterness and it gives us a better understanding of what goes on. Now, remember we, we started this morning in Ruth chapter 1 and Naomi and family made, embarked on a journey. They went over to Moab hoping to have a better life. Right? It was a time of famine and it was a time of economic difficulty in the country of Israel and they decided it was time to pack up and to move on. 
The circumstances were difficult. We understand that. Okay? Um, the, the risk and the threat was real. They could lose everything they have. They, they, they could lose uh, their, all their livestock, whatever, but they were prepared to give up everything in order to make the move. Right? In other words, Naomi's husband bet everything. He literally, as they say, bet the farm. Right? Everything, hoping that the move to Moab will actually turn out to be better. Right? That it will pay off. But no sooner they got there, it, didn't, it wasn't very long before her husband died. Okay? And two sons found themselves wives. There were two weddings. And every wedding is always full of joy and, and with much hope and promise for the future to come. But it was not to be because both husbands died. And what Naomi found herself with was that not only was she a widow, but tragically, two young women also became widows. Now she's saddled with a lot of responsibility and she has to care for them and she decides that she's going to go back home. But midway, she decides that, you know, it's too much trouble and she told the two, the two daughters-in-law that, you know, why don't you just go home to your, your parents, to your mother's home, all right? And by the way, when she, I think when she mentioned that it was to the mother's home, uh, I don't know, it, there is a hint of possibility that, that those were matriarchal societies, all right? But she told them to go home one went back, Ofra went back, but Ruth decided, you know, I'm going to stay. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Right? Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Right? Uh, thy God shall be my God. Right? And, is it, and even if you die there, that I will also die there and I will be buried there. She staked her entire future to be together with Naomi. And don't forget, she is a daughter-in-law. And what she decided to do was, as family, she said, you know, I will not abandon you. I will stick with you, right? And we will weather, we'll go through this together. They went back, and of course, everyone was stirring. The whole town was buzzing because Naomi has come back. But then, it wasn't long before people started noticing something else because Naomi is not the same Naomi as before. Something had changed. And all those questions, you know, people would have been asking, what happened? What happened to you? You know, um, you know we haven't seen you for a while. You know, what's, what happened to your husband? I thought you had two children. You know, and there were so many uncomfortable, difficult questions to answer. And she finally said, okay, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Why? Because it means bitter. Okay, I'm bitter. I'm bitter because... God has taken everything away. I went out full. I came back empty. I have nothing now. All right? The hand of the Lord is against me. God is against me. He has deliberately afflicted me with all this. It's His fault. And I cannot do anything about it. I am just a victim. And He is there, up there. Right? This big, powerful person, like a bully. And He did all this to me. I'm bitter. I don't know if you find it familiar because by the when you get into Job chapter 2, you remember all the terrible things that happened to Job? And what did his wife say? Why don't you just curse God and die? Alright? Just blame him, curse him, and then you know let him strike you dead, and that's it. Now, I don't know about you, but Inherent in all this, there is a certain viewpoint of who God is. There is a certain mistaken and warped understanding of the person and character of God. All right? And Naomi has that view of God. Now, as we talk about bitterness here, all right, and, and we're in Hebrews chapter 12. Now, I want to start off with this thought here that bitterness is something that afflicts many people. In fact, it can afflict anybody. Right? Nobody is exempted from this. Okay? You and I don't have to live very long on this earth before you will experience something that could bring bitterness into your life. Okay? 
It doesn't matter if you're a child, you're a young person, or even a pastor or adult, whoever. All right, understand this. There will situations will arise that will tempt us to be, tempt us with the sin of bitterness. Now, it's interesting because when you get to, let's turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 1, because it was the Lord Jesus Christ that taught us that it is impossible to have a trouble free life. You realize that? Okay, look at Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Then said he to, unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. You hear that? The offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. Alright, it says it is impossible. Trouble will come into our lives. Now, he, the problem today is that when you look at the better part of 20th and 21st century Christianity is that we have somehow caught on to the idea that once you are saved, God will just scoop you into His loving arms and that no trouble will ever come, right? You will have no pain, no suffering, uh, uh, you know, you will not get sick, you will not be poor and all these things and it, it ignores the fact that you know something, heaven is not here. And that life of painlessness and no and, and okay and comfort is not now and so many people spend all their time and energy trying to avoid any trouble and bitter experiences and the longer okay now if, if, you, if as a pastor now the longer you get to be a pastor one of the things you're going to see here is that bitterness is a major problem in many believers lives sometimes they don't know it which is why it's important to teach and preach on this subject okay because it can fester it can be in there like a wound that never heals it just gets infected and gets worse and worse and then we try to live on we try to move on as best as we can but what we don't realize is that we are never the same again and we can never move forward as quickly as we like because it's holding us back In fact, it is possible that it could be the number one sin for many Christians. It's deep down, but we don't acknowledge it. We try to act that, uh, we act as if it doesn't exist. And it's so well hidden that we think it's fine. And once again, I emphasize nobody, nobody is exempted. You and I today, if we were to think about it, if we understand how bitterness works, you and I can realize that there are people today that are no longer in church. They are not in some other church. They are even sitting at home. Out of fellowship with God and out of fellowship with the brethren. Why? Because of bitterness. Okay? I know of a brilliant young pastor because of things that happened in the church. Uh, and because he tried to do the right thing He tried to set people right And because they, those people were bitter against his pastor And he was caught in the middle of the whole thing Today he is not in any church at all He's at home on Sunday in his living room Alright I can think of Christians who have foolishly gone on to make very, very bad, very poor decisions Because of bitterness And now they are living out the rest of their lives in the living out the consequences of what has happened. Now, you don't even have to get past the first few chapters of the Bible, right, in Genesis, to see that this led to the first murder. Cain rose up against his brother Abel. Okay? What his anger, his wrath against God was directed at man. You can't get back at God. You can't hurt God. So he had to hurt somebody else. And he killed his brother. And bitterness has left its mark throughout history in the lives of people, right? Children, adults, teenagers, many who are scarred by that, that it now rules their life. So when you look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 onwards, I want us to examine now these just few verses when you di dissect it, it shows you something at work. And it also shows you the mechanism 
and reveals the problem. Right? So we're going to look at that and take this apart. So the first thing I want, to, I want us to see here is that there, the talk, okay, bitterness and its toxic effects. Notice verse 14, follow peace with all men. Right? Be at peace with everyone. Follow peace. Seek to find it. Seek to make it work. And you notice the second part, holiness. Right? You cannot be, just be at peace with men without holiness. Okay? And so one without the other is, 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 uh, is, okay, is nonsense. Is this without which, it says, no man shall see the Lord. Now, it doesn't end there because there is a colon. All right? For verse, 14, verse 15 follows immediately after that. It's still continuing on the thought. Okay? No man shall see God. Realize this, that bitterness can hinder you, can obscure. All right? What goes on inside, the bitterness that's in you, can obscure our vision of the Lord. It will become a barrier to us coming to the Lord. It doesn't change your salvation. But you know, we want to be close to God. We want to walk close with Him. We want to have access to Him. But you know, we, there are things here that we can allow that will hinder and block that. Alright? Especially when we don't follow peace with all men and we don't follow holiness. It gets in the way. Now, it says looking diligently. All right, it tells us here that we need to be very vigilant. All right, we need to be very careful. Why? It says, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Okay? N now, in other words, the bad situations that come in your life and mine we already established that it is impossible but that offences will come. It's a matter of time. Offences will come, things are going to happen to you and I. Right? Things are going to happen even to your pastor and his wife and their family. Nobody can stop that. But, it says you need to look diligently. Right? Looking diligently also to the Lord. Why? Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now, to understand this, we have to realize God's grace does not fail us. So why does this verse say that lest any man fail of the grace of God? Because we can fail to avail ourselves of the grace of God. What do I mean? The grace of God is the help that God gives to each and every one of us. Right? We need God's grace. That's why we cannot be saved on our own effort Right? We need His help. Yeah. Okay? Now, the grace of God is also effective and is there for us in our daily lives. Right? In particular, notice in 1 Peter chapter 3, husbands and wives, we are told that there is the grace of life that is given by God to every, to every couple. But not when you are divided against each other, when you're not standing together. Okay? We need grace. We need the help of God because you and I know, left to ourselves, life is difficult. Okay, it doesn't matter what country or city you live in, daily life and you know, if you look at the, what's going to come in the next 10 years or next 20 years, it's not easy. Being an adult is not easy. Right? Being a husband or wife, being a father or mother, it's not easy. We need God's grace. But the problem here is that God's grace does not diminish but now we fail to turn to the grace of God. We fail of the grace of God. Why? Because we don't use it. We don't turn to it. You see what I'm saying here? Now, this room is fairly large size. Now, what's going to happen if I decide that I'm going to try to talk like this and you'll notice very quickly that I need help. If I, without the microphone, without the sound system, right, and the amplifier, I'm going to need a lot of help uh, to reach the back of the, the room. 
Now I can choose to use this microphone and, and the sound system to amplify my voice so that it reaches to the back, or without which I will have to raise my voice, right, and shout, and then possibly by you know the third or fourth, uh, third lesson or so, maybe uh, let's say I lose my voice. I'm struggling, and many of us are like that because. Where the grace of God is there, it's available to us even when these things happen. We're not turning to Him. Right? We're not availing ourselves of the grace of God. What happens? We can fail of the grace of God. Okay? God never fails us. His grace is always sufficient for us. It's always there. But it still needs the free will choice of man to accept it and to use it. Now, what hinders us? Sometimes we take things into our own in our own hands. Sometimes because of pride, right? Sometimes you know because of that we don't want his help. Now, by the way, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Because as soon as your children are old enough to stand up and walk, right? Not only the first one of the first words they say is no, but sometimes when you they're trying to. They're walking and they're not stable and they're about to fall down or whatever and you try to help them. No! No! Why? Because I can do it. I can do it. I don't need your help. I don't want your help. How many of you had friends who you know they needed help but they, did, they made it clear they did not want your help? So what happens now? Okay? So looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Okay, so the first thing is not turning to the God's grace. Then there is another thing that we allow. This is lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now, we have to understand one thing about this is that bitterness starts small. It's like a root. Okay? Imagine the seed starts sprouting a little root. It's small, it's insignificant. Okay? Now, but here's the problem. What it's telling us in verse 15 is that we've got to look diligently in case any root of bitterness starts to spring up. What happens when you put that into the ground, the root starts to go in? Many trees, you notice big tall trees are very stable. They can withstand a storm. Why? Because the roots spread out and go deep. And they anchor that tree into the ground. The root can grow and grow and spread out and it starts to touch other parts of your life bit by bit. More and more aspects of your life. But it's still not visible. It can lie under the ground for some time. But then it says there is a point when it springs up. You see what I'm saying here? There's a point that it starts to spring up. And is this the danger? Is it less any root of bitterness springing up trouble you? It starts to bring trouble to your life. Okay, now at the point that it springs up, it breaks the ground. Now that's when you start to notice it. And even then, this is still a small thing. It starts to grow. Now the mechanics of this is that it says it's springing up, trouble you, and then it says, and thereby many be defiled. Do you see the, the effect here that there is a contaminating effect because it spreads from one person to another? Right? What begins as a small thing, as a small root that nobody notices, it now goes in, in deep and spread, goes very broad, and then it starts to come out. It breaks from the ground. Now, by the time it breaks from the ground and it's visible, it begins to bring trouble into the, your life but then notice it does not end there bitterness will infect all the people around you why because of you it's like a deadly virus right that if we allow it to develop or fester in us what happens that 
it will touch others, our loved ones, okay, our friends. Beginning with one church member to another, to another, and eventually many of the members of the church. Entire ministries can be based on this, where, where they are headed by bitter men in the pulpit. And you can tell from the preaching and all that, that after a while it grates on you, it grinds on you, and then soon, sooner or later you get infected and then it spreads to other people and you can go from church to church and across the world. Be careful of those who preach with a bitter spirit. Right? Years ago, I, I found there was some, an evangelist that was very famous because he went around as he preached and he was very popular, but uh, f- the preaching, the, he was very popular as for his preaching, but for usually the wrong reasons. But later I found out that when you talk to the churches that have invited him, he has left a train wreck of churches, casualties. Why? Because somehow he has the ability to connect with the bitterness of someone in that church, and eventually that person will move to do something and eventually the pastor's gone. Church after church was affected like that. But, you know, churches without pastors and in the trouble that they're in and they're distracted by all that, usually can't connect what happened to the person that stirred all this stuff. Okay? So, what this verse is warning us is be careful of bitterness do not allow it to even begin to take root. Because once you do it, it is not going to stop there. It's all going to affect you, right? And everybody else that you touch. Since many be defiled. Now, you, you can see one thing here that where someone is defiled, what happens? There will be a decline and a fall from holiness and spirituality. All right? And here, notice, I will just gonna complete the picture here very quickly because it leads to a lot of other issues. All right? and, and in verse 16, it talks about someone who we are familiar with in Genesis, Esau. And Esau made a bunch of decisions that totally changed the course of his life because of bitterness. Okay? It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. That's how the word of God describes Esau. Who? It says, for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Think about this. Esau had a birthright. Right? Birthright from his father. Isaac. But because of things that happened, now what happened? They, they were born, the mo- when they were born, Esau was supposed to be the firstborn. Alright? Then, Jacob. But prior to their birth, the Lord already explained that why was there a struggle inside the womb of his mother, Rebecca? was because there are two nations, two different group, types of people inside. And then it says that God makes it very clear. The younger, the older will serve the younger. The older will be the one that will actually gain the... The younger will be actually the one that will get the inheritance of the firstborn and will have the right to rule. And you know, all their life, as they grew up, they knew about it. Mom and dad knew about it. That's why mom and dad, if you... read the life of Esau and Jacob, mom and dad were divided against each other. Both had their favorites. Right? Both had their favorites. And then, you know, Esau one day came back from hunting. He, <coughs> he was starving. Right? Jacob was sitting there uh, brewing some, some sort of stew. And then, he says, I'm hungry. Give me something to eat before I die. Right? He's just such a drama queen. All right, he's hungry, and then what does he do? He's like, if I don't eat, I will die. He says, give me something. And Jacob being the sly guy, what did he say? Fine, I'll sell it to you. If you want to drink this soup, I'll sell it to you. Sell me your birthright. Now, he said, I'm about to die, so what's the big deal? Okay, 
Now, here was someone who is so profane. He's so driven by the flesh and the loss of the flesh. You know, hunger was overpowering for him. To him, it was better to eat a bowl of soup and to give up his entire future and inheritance. And he says, you know, I'm about to die. He says, what is this? That inheritance, that birthright was nothing to him. And in his bitterness also, he sold that. Because why? What's the big deal? I'm not going to be the one. In fact, it says, God says, I'm going to bow down to my younger brother. He profaned his birthright. He looked at that as something cheap. Now, many times... You're going to have young people who, in their bitterness, because of things that may have happened at home and with mom and dad and the family circumstances, in that bitterness, what happens? That they give up an entire future for a moment of pleasure with someone. It's not nothing precious, it's nothing worth protecting or preserving. So, what's the big deal? This inheritance was not merely money or material things. There was a whole spiritual legacy, but he felt that was not worth it. All it's worth is a bowl of soup. You know, business can make us evaluate things very differently. Realize that that um, that was why when Naomi said, call me Mara, don't call me Naomi. Right? I went out full, I came back with nothing. And she could not evaluate correctly, or accurately that many would be blessed to have a daughter-in-law like Ruth beside her. Why? In that bitterness, it blinds us to many things. Okay, And some of us here tonight, you may be starting to get what I'm talking about because you're reminded about there are things that may be buried deep inside. And as the, but understand this, it, it can be very entrenched because as the roots go deeper and deeper and they spread out, getting it out is much more difficult. That's why the earlier you deal with this, the better. Okay, now you notice there was it in verse seventeen. You see, in the case of Esau, that it got to a point where there was a point of no return because for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, even though uh, though he sought it carefully with tears. All right, and so realize here that when we are making decisions and our heart is broken and our heart has been made bitter, that we can go on a path where there is a path of no return. And even later, with regret, it's too late. You can't turn that around. Bitterness, okay, is not only toxic, it is also not easy to detect. That's why we notice the root, right? It's small and it's under, under the ground. It's not easy to detect. Now, one example of this in the, in the scriptures was pictured by the water of Mara right, in Exodus chapter 15. Look at Exodus chapter 15 and from verse 22 to 25. It says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara for they were bitter. Now this is the same name from which Naomi got her name, Mara. Okay? Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. Now, okay, before we get there, I want to see here that they went through the wilderness for three days, right, after they went from the Red Sea. And throughout that time, they found no water. Okay? Not having water to drink even for a day, it's, things start to get very, very difficult. 
Okay? It was a difficult time. They had just left Egypt. They went through a tremendous time of victory against Pharaoh. They celebrated. Now they came to this place. They finally, finally, here was water. After three days of wandering around, searching, and they found water. Now, anticipation was building up. As the people got closer and closer to this source of water, what happens? There was excitement. All right? They saw this, and now, remember, we're looking at the situation, we're looking at the circumstances, and then everyone's thinking, yes, this is the solution to our problems. And then they went there, what happens? The water was bitter. Now, it wasn't just the taste. This was talking about how also this was poisonous. It's toxic. You can't drink this. If it was merely the taste, you can still, I don't know, maybe hold your nose and grit your teeth, you're just trying to drink it down. Uh, we do that with medicine. Right? We do that. Right? Or sometimes some remedy that grandma brewed up and she says, you drink this and you will be well. And I was like, if I drink this, I'll probably feel sicker. But we can still try to hold on. But here they went there and they found, you know what? After discovering this source of water, it was a huge disappointment. And what happens? They found the water was bitter. Right? And what happens? That's what usually happens in church. People start complaining about the pastor. They start murmuring against Moses. What kind of leader is this? What kind of navigation? You led us there from the sea. We could not drink the sea water. Three days into the wilderness, there was nothing. We finally find water. And then guess what? We can't drink it. We're all going to die. Right? God brought us all the way out here just so that we will die. Amazing, God. What are you doing? Hmm? And that, that prophet of yours, Moses, what's he doing? Does he even know what he's doing? It's going to take us days to get back to where we can find water. We'll die along the way and then we're done. Right? What a great move. Now, can you, can you and I recognize that we can get into that kind of reasoning and that kind of talk, even in church? That something happens and there is a major disappointment and uh, we don't understand how all this is going to work out but everyone starts murmuring and grumbling and whatever and realize this over, uh, over, the, over and over again in the wilderness you know how many people died because of the sin of murmuring? Seriously. You know a lot of people died because of that? God's not amused. Okay, because the first sign of trouble, what happens and the first thing that always gets questioned is God's love for us. Do you realize that? We always doubt and question God's love for us a moment we run into trouble. Right? Oh, obviously this is happening, right? Because He doesn't like us. He wants us to die. Right? He won't stop until all our carcasses, all our bones lie there in the wilderness. Then why would the Lord go through the trouble of getting them out of Egypt? Right? Opening a way in the Red Sea, they walked, the scriptures record over and over again that they walked on dry land. But again, first hitch first sign of a hiccup, first sign of trouble, people murmur. You have to realize this is in our fallen nature. Okay? And so as they did that, what, what happens? What was the remedy? Now Moses cried unto the Lord, he prayed, and then the Lord showed him a tree, which he had cast into the waters. The waters were made sweet, and there he made for them a statue and an ordinance. But notice this, and there he proved them. You realize that the Lord allowed that to happen as a form of testing? To test, would they be committed to following him or not? Okay? Now, some observations here, right? So from a distance, and even as they got closer to that, this body of water, there's no way to tell that the waters were bitter and undrinkable. They look inviting, they look calm, 
It looked like something would be good for them. Okay? And as with sometimes many things that we, we try to decide to do in life, everything looks good. Now, the only way to know was to taste it. And that was when they found the truth. <coughs> okay? It looked like something would cool them down in the heat of the desert, but when they drank that, it was terrible. Now, bitterness of the waters was hard to detect. It could not be known by observation. Right? Not even when you get close to it. Until you actually taste it, right? you're not going to know. Now, there is a picture of this, of bitterness, and I was pictured by the vines of Sodom. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 32 to 33. So for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall and their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and cruel venom of apps. Notice, it tells us that the vines, right, the grapes that you harvest in Sodom were bitter. Okay? Something changed after Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And something changed in the land. Okay? There were attempts to, okay, although there were no more cities there, there were attempts to grow, cultivate the land, to grow grapes. And, you know, it, the grapes take time to grow. Right? You plant it and, it's, you know, it's not something that you can reap. Okay? It's not something that you plant in springtime and you're going to reap by the end of summer. It's time consuming, takes a while, and then until you get the first fruits. All right? And then what happened was that when they finally gathered the clusters, they discovered they were bitter. Now, realize this bitter people can be like the grapes of Sodom. How? Beautiful on the outside. Inviting. And then the moment you put that into your mouth and you bite, oh, yuck. What is this? All right. He said, you, you taste the poison. He said, the wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of apps. Okay. That's a type of snake. Okay. A venomous snake. Okay, it, this thing is poisonous. And realize when you find a bitter person was a bitter Christian, you know, what's inside, once you get past the outer shell, what's inside can be very, very toxic. Okay? But that person needs Okay, that person needs help, but you have to beware also because it can affect you. Remember, Hebrews twelve warned us it can defile uh, many that many others can be defiled. So you, you have to handle this very carefully. All right, but this bitterness is not detectable just for, by looking at it. Some of the friendliest people and warmest people are great friends to have until you get too close to them. Why? Because then it stirs up their fear and their anxiety and then you start to find that you cannot get close to those people. Okay? There is a limit. Why? Because they have issues of bitterness in their life. And when you get too close, what happens? Inevitably, you're going to fight. Okay? Why? Because there is a long-standing problem. Now, this picture is something that's hidden in the heart also. Look at James 3 verse 13 to 15. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show all of a good conversation, his works with meekness or wisdom. Is it but if ye have bitter envying and strife, notice, in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Right? There's nothing to be proud of, there's nothing to glory over, and at the same time, you know, don't deny it because many times we cover it up, we think that, you know, we, we dress it up so that it's as if it's not there. All right? And it says, this wisdom descended not from above. This did not come from God, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay? 
Here it's picture as what? Bitterness pictures something that's in the heart of a person. Alright? So notice, you and I can come right up to a person and we're not going to know just from the outside here that there is bitterness lurking inside. Why? Because it's in the heart. It's deep down. And as I mentioned just now, so some of the nicest and friendliest people could be walking casualties because there's bitterness inside. And like the grapes, this kind of heart problem, it takes time. Right? The grapes took time, the vine to grow before the grapes come out. And then the fruit of that, that was when the bitterness, the bitter grapes were detected. All right? and, and this heart problem, it grows and grows into full maturity. And then we find that it's in there. Now, there is a parallel even in the real world because what happens when you and I have heart trouble? You can go to the doctor, but the doctor cannot diagnose this just by looking at you. Right? You can't just say, well, you're looking pale, you know, uh, this and that. No, it doesn't work that way. All right? And even by listening to your heart, it may not be detectable. Okay? Not without detailed tests. You can't just look at a person the way they eat, drink, exercise, and say, well, you know, that person looks normal. Okay, but understand this. Long before the heart attack comes, the damage and all, all these problems have been building up for many years. Okay, how do we detect these things? You literally have to take x-rays, a series of x-rays. These days, through a CT, okay, heart CT scan to find out whether the arteries are clogged and how badly and which of them, okay? Because there are four that you have to look at in the heart, okay? But understand this, you can talk to the person and say, I feel fine. And they, many will feel fine until the heart attack comes, right? And you cannot see it from the outside, okay? Just listening to the heart is not going to Okay, fine. You know, you're not going to be a fine out. Now, but what happens is this. And so it takes like a, literally an x-ray, all right, a CT scan to be able to see what's inside. And the Word of God is able to penetrate all that. Right? Sharper than any two-edged sword. And is able to cut through all those layers and even through all the camouflage and all the disguises that we put up to search us out to reveal what is really in our heart. And you will know it because sometimes when we come to certain scriptures and it tells us, right, to forgive someone and we're like, okay, I didn't read that. Okay, I didn't see that. I want to move on. We, de we, we engage in denial. If you ask a bitter person, you say, no, I'm not bitter. I'm fine. All right, Mon, do you have a problem? No, no problem. No, I, no problem. Uh, actually, not Mon. Usually, you ask your wife, is everything okay? Yeah, no problem. Okay. And you know you're in trouble. Okay? Now, so understand this. Realize you and I are not spiritual and close to God just because there is an absence of trouble in our lives. Okay? Trouble will come. Psalm 34 verse 19 tells us, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Okay? They will come, but the Lord is there. He is available and He can take us out of those things. But here's the problem. We try to act as normal as possible. We mask the reality. We try to avoid everyone, anyone detecting that there may be a problem deep inside. Whether in the marriage, in the workplace, between mom and dad, you know, in our home and family, or, you know, there could be a parent who's deep in sin. But the fact is that, that the problem exists and there is... Uh, he, but when the trouble comes, right, understand this, there is an opportunity for God to show Himself faithful and powerful. Just because trouble comes into your life doesn't mean that you are out of the will of God. Do you realize, if that were the case, the one person who is out of the will of God, who have been the Apostle Paul. You know how much trouble he had? Yeah. Over and over and over again. And yet he was exactly in God's plan. 
Okay? But realize this, unless we get it treated, what happens? It's going to get worse and worse until it brings a lot of trouble into our lives and then it defiles other people. Alright? It defiles other people and we need the Word of God to search us, examine us together with the Holy Spirit to expose and reveal what is in there. That requires you and I to be very honest with God all right, as he searches us out. Okay, realize this. This was a very well-known illustration in a book uh, written many years ago, but it illustrates this principle very clearly. Now, if you look at every morning, right, uh, for breakfast and then uh, for our refreshments here, you will see that there is one container with tea. Correct? Now, and then you will see that there are tea bags, a whole bunch of tea bags that they put there in the, into the pot with the hot water. Now, the way most of us picture it is this, okay? You take the tea bag, you put it into your cup, full of hot water, and what happens? Where do you get your tea from? The flavor of the tea, where does it come from? Hmm? It comes from what's inside the tea bag, isn't it? Just like what's inside your heart. Okay, now, how did you get the flavor? The hot water merely all the hot water did was to reveal the flavor of what's already in the bag. Now, what many people do is this. The flavor comes out, I don't like this flavor of tea. What do I do? We change the hot water. We'll go to another church. We'll enter in a different, another marriage. We'll just divorce and then we'll marry again. All right? I don't like this town. Well, I can move from Mindanao to Luzon. Well, things are not working out. However, we will change the circumstances. We'll change the water. We'll leave the Philippines. We'll go to America. Oh, America's terrible. We don't like the place anymore. We'll move to Canada. Now, you can go and change the water over and over and over again. It does not change the flavor. And many times people don't realize, as long as the bitterness and all the other issues are in there, everywhere they go, they experience the same thing. Why? Because it's the problem follows them. Now, so how do you change the flavor? Maybe, okay, uh, okay personally, the tea that they serve, I don't like Lipton's. I really don't like that because Lipton's, it, it, it's better when you drink it with milk, not black. Okay? I like some of the tea. Now, how do you get a different flavor? You cannot do it by changing the water. The water merely reveals the contents, just as the hot and painful trouble and circumstances of your life, they merely reveal what's already in your heart. You see what I'm saying here? They only reveal what's in your heart. So now, how do you get a different flavor? You have to change what's in the heart. You have to change the tea leaves that are inside the tea bag. If you don't change that, you always get the same flavor. You see what I'm saying here? Okay. Now, in other words, once we understand that, we realize you cannot. Okay, I know I'm, I'm a bit more heavily dependent on the illustration tonight. Okay, but we've already laid out the principle, so this is merely reinforcing this, what I'm trying to say. Now, in other words, if you are having problems in your marriage, okay, now, one of the worst things that happened to, to someone I knew was they were having serious problems in the marriage, and the wife said, you know, let's have a baby. It's going to fix all the problems. And my friend said, <laughs> you got to be kidding. This is with the way my wife is right now. No way am I going to have a child with her. 
Okay, the way things are, I said, no way am I, do I even want to touch her. Okay, why? Because it can actually, again, the idea was what? We change the circumstances, the problems will go away. It doesn't. This person knew it's going to make it worse. Okay, people sometimes will change a job, not realizing that they are the problem. I warned someone, I said, look, just leaving church like this, it's not going to work because you're going to go to the other side. The, your problems are going with you. The person refused to believe me. It took longer, more than 10 years. But after that, true enough, just a couple of years ago, that person left the other church. And by the way, then the pastor told me, he said, I'm very sorry, I was wrong. Okay, I shouldn't have received that person or to transfer that person's membership over to our church. Why? Because sometimes we assume, okay, if I leave here, you know, I'm going to go to the other church, the, the pastor there, I, I can work with his style. But the issue goes beyond just whether it's a style, a, a style of leadership or whatever. Okay? And so, realize this, until we change the contents of our heart, the circumstances only reveal what is already in there. So even if you change your circumstances, what do you do? Something else will come along which will reveal that the problem is still there. And guess what? If it's, for instance, if it's in the marriage, yes, you can move to a different country, right? You can move to Europe and then live a life that's blissful for six months, a year, and then the problems start to catch up with you. Why? Because nothing actually changed about the two people. You see what I'm saying here? So we have to realize that because this is deep inside and it's hard to detect, all right, that very the majority of cases, changing the outside, the circumstances, the things around us is not going to improve the situation. Until we are prepared to be honest to really examine ourselves. Now, let's look at one example, all right, and go to Acts chapter 5. And we're already quite familiar with this because we've dealt with this a couple of times during the Bible, uh, Bible conference. Acts chapter, sorry, I said Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. All right, Acts chapter 8 verse 5 because we see Philip, one of the deacons in the church, go, he goes down to Samaria to preach Christ. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And notice, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, to the extent it says, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and, and, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. Great joy comes when people get saved. All right? And here, Philip was the one who went there and preached that. Now then, verse 9 tells us, you were introduced to a man called Simon. Said, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in that same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. Now, what was the purpose? He giving out that he himself, that himself was some great one. Okay? He had used all this witchcraft and all that, his so-called magical powers to show to everyone, pro promote himself, that he was someone, somebody, very powerful, he was very influential, and obviously he got very rich as a result of that. Right? We see that uh, he was very influential in the next verse, because to whom they all gave heed. You, know, you know what? People went to him all the time to, for counsel and for permission. Hmm. Sounds like some pastors. When I said from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. It really sounds like some pastors. And to him they had regard. Okay? It's a big shot. Because of that long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, right? Everything changed. Okay, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, all of a sudden, what happens? A whole bunch of these people were saved, they got baptized. Now, Christ is now their Lord, not Him. What happened here? All of a sudden, this guy, right, remember that he was that some great one, now got demoted. 
oh, that's not good. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Again, notice the church in Jerusalem sent men up to see what was really happening on the ground to confirm and to verify that truly even the Samaritans were getting saved. Okay, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Right? This is, and, and this was a sign to the unbelieving Jews. Right? It confirmed that they had also received the Holy Ghost just like the, 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 the Hebrews. Okay? These are Gentiles. Right? In fact, kind of half because they were what? Half Jewish, half... Okay, that's why the, 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 they despise the Samaritans. They were considered as half breeds. Now, but it says here, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. So now, here's this guy, right? Now he used to be a big shot, a very powerful magician, sorcerer, and everyone gave he, everyone paid attention. Now, if he said something, they all listened. If he was unhappy about something, they all took note of that also. Okay? He was able to sway and influence everyone's opinions. All of a sudden, now that Jesus Christ is Lord, all these people had, are now disciples of Christ. What happens? His status just dropped overnight. Diminished to almost nothing. Okay? And so, there he is. He's observing right, Peter and John. And what did they do? They, they prayed, they laid hands, and then, you know, uh, they, these people, uh, the Samaritans, they received the Holy Ghost. And he says, you know I want to be able to do that too. If I can have the power to impart that, you know, I can regain that same status again, you know, that same power, that same influence. So he offered Peter money, right? He says, so that he can have this ability. And what happens now? He wants the same thing and Peter tells him, Thy money perish with thee, verse 20. Because thou hast taught that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Alright, he rebukes Simon for this. He tells him, you know, that his heart was not right with God. He says, but thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Now, he, by, by, by the way, he's saying, you have no part with any of us. Even though he had professed faith, and he was baptized, and he was rebuked. Now, he says, you know, neither part nor lot. Do you realize he's not even a partner as far as that church as that the kingdom of God was concerned? He says, thy money perish. Pointed him, told him to his face, you're lost. Why? For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. You realize that? Some of us here, you know, in our bitterness, we, as much as we disguise it and we don't refuse to recognize it, we deny it, realize that we, our heart is no longer right with God. He, he told him, therefore, what was the remedy? To say, repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. He told a perishing man, right? He said, thy money perish with thee. He said, repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Notice, for I perceive. Now, Peter, as a man of God, as a, a minister now, God had given him the discernment. He said, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness. Okay? This was poison. The poison of bitterness and all that was working in his heart. And he says, and in the bond of iniquity. He answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Alright, he was in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. Now, and Peter had the spiritual perception to be able to confront him directly to his face. As I mentioned here, alright, because he was once feared and respected and status, had status and power, but now what happens? He's merely a member of a New Testament church. No different from the rest of them. 
Now, and this built up a deep envy and dissatisfaction. Now, years ago, I, I, I was told about this. There was a man in Nepal, in Kathmandu, who was a holy man. Now, in, in Hinduism, a, a holy man is a living god. Okay, he's a god on two legs. Okay? They even have a little booth or corner, like for instance, if there's a hole here, like where, and Milka is sitting in there. Now, they will have the holy man sit inside. Right? There is an assistant, and everyone come and they will offer gifts as they put that through the window. They will offer gifts. And you know, there's an assistant who will arrange all this. Now, he gets a lot of stuff. People will offer all sorts of things to the holy man. Remember, he's a divine living God in human form. Okay? Uh, I have a classmate who is now in India and he is a holy man. He's a living God. Okay? Modern one, but still a living God. Now, this man in Kathmandu, what happened was he heard the gospel preach and came under conviction and when he got saved, became a member of the church. Now, then there was a problem because after he got saved, think about this, he went from being God, being a sinner, saved by grace. His wife was not happy. Okay? She, his wife was not happy. She was bitter. Why? Because this guy just took a huge demotion. And how, what was he going to live on? No one's going to come and give him things anymore. All right? I thank God one thing, this man from that point on, he, he was always at the temples preaching the gospel to the other holy men, pleading with them to repent from their idolatry and all this, and then to turn to Christ and his finished work. Okay? But his wife was bitter and she was not happy, but eventually she agreed to attend church. And after some weeks, as they prayed for her and they dealt with her, she came to Christ. Okay? But realize, now, bitterness can come because there is a deep dissatisfaction because something had happened, because we did not get our way, because of disappointment. Now, it can be because of what somebody else did. Maybe it's what somebody else said or did in church. But there is a deep dissatisfaction and it translates to a deep resentment against other people. Now realize this, if you and I are bitter, we, just like this man, all right, like Simon the Sorcerer, we can find ourselves in spiritual bondage. Okay, Because what's going to happen here is this. Going back to Ruth chapter 1, now Naomi can move back physically into Israel. But can I point out to you, some of you here tonight, if you don't recognize that you have bitterness and you're not prepared to deal with this, what happens is, just like Naomi, you can move back to Israel, but you are stuck. At that point of your life, at whatever happened, and you cannot move on. Now, it can be, it doesn't even have to be something bad, wicked, or evil. Do you realize some people could be bitter simply because through death you lost someone but you are not going to move on. You won't let go. You can keep going back every day to the grave and you're never going to be able to leave the city because of that. If you are a parent, guess what? Like I said, there is a deep dissatisfaction about the situation. It shouldn't have happened. It happened too early, too soon, whatever it was. But well, we're not going to let go. And guess what? If you're a parent, you're going to hold back all the children. Okay? I've seen this firsthand in that there can be families that over the years, now they sit at the dinner table, they do not talk about the fact that the father had passed away years ago. And sometimes it becomes that you cannot mourn. There's no mourning. No one's allowed to mourn or talk about it. And 
the sad part is this the whole family in practical terms that whole family already died it's not just one person why? because we're hurting right? where the mom is hurting the children are also hurting they're all messed up for some of us here you know you have had very bitter disappointments okay and I thank God that you're here now in this church but if you don't hand over the bitterness over what has happened in the past you can find yourself even even though you're in a good church that you are unable to trust the pastor because you had issues of trust before that trust was violated right you suffered a lot of damage because of that you've been hurt and I'm not going to trust another pastor again maybe someone here you know you've had your heart broken before and you know what you said well it's okay I'm just going to serve God I'm just going to be faithful but the truth is I'm never going to trust another person with my heart again but I'm going to try to dress this up so that it looks spiritual but the reality is okay the problem doesn't stay still remember the roots continue to grow and they continue to spread and it's a matter of time before it troubles you thereby many others be defiled okay I think one of the worst ones that I saw unfortunately from afar because this happened in another church church staff member who had surrendered full time to serve something happened I'm not sure what but all of a sudden she was no longer staff member but whatever injustice that may be okay you and I can choose what to do and then to move on from there by the grace of God right? that we not fail of the grace of God we avail ourselves of that we turn to the grace of God we depend on that to move on because you and I are not going to be able to do it by ourselves okay? but along comes an aunt who was bitter and one of the most dangerous things is when a bitter person attempts to help you or counsel you. Because what they do is they infect you with their personal bitterness and make the situation much worse. I saw this. Okay, by, by the time I found out what happened, it was very late. And this person was no longer the same because this person went out of her mind. I had to go in and out of the mental institution a number of times. Okay? And was on so much medication that what I saw was very much a shell and a ghost of a person. Why? Because somebody else came along and incited the bitterness because of their own bitterness to stir things up. Right? Sometimes ladies okay sometimes it is the bitter mother-in-law bitter senior lady in the church right who has her issues with her husband and therefore her issues with men who then stir the dissatisfaction in the other younger ladies and you know what you are not a godly example you have to deal with your issues because you are not helping anybody else you're making things worse men we can become very stubborn and bullheaded because sometimes that came from the bitterness when we were growing up because we had issues with our own fathers and men can i say this the the more you focus on your father's failures and his faults instead of focusing on christ you know what happens you grow up and you eventually become more and more like him I know I've been there I've been there but you know 
this year my father passed away long before that some years back we my sister and i we both made our peace with him we both 10 years back chose to love him in spite of who he is why because we on we will honor our father and mother all right but understand this that you and i can focus so much on the person who did something really bad to us and it doesn't matter if you bear the physical scars. Understand this, the, the scars, the spiritual and emotional scars inside are worse. But there is a God and there is a Savior and He has the balm of Gilead and He can bring the healing and He can soothe the pain and He can remove that and the day will come that you, you no longer remember that. Look at the life of Joseph. Remember one thing, his brothers tried to murder him. They changed their minds and that's when they sold him as a slave. But they wanted to kill him. All right? The things that he suffered over and over again, many people in our modern day would have already gone nuts and gone crazy or had depression and then killed themselves. But ask yourself this question, if Joseph had failed, what would have happened? If he had failed and died in prison, what would have happened? many lives who have been lost and including his whole family which was fractured falling apart right every one of the family had issues and problems god used one person to eventually turn things around and a new nation emerge if joseph had failed all would have been lost Okay, if Naomi and Ruth had failed, what would have happened? Do you realize that there will be no David and Solomon? Now, we have limited time, so let's, let's wrap up here. I want us to think about this, every one of us. Many of us here probably stand at a certain crossroads right now. And it could be that as we've been dealing with this, that the Lord is getting your attention on the fact that there are certain things buried deep inside. Okay? And can I say this? Only the Lord can fix what's broken. Okay? And you're going to have to trust Him. But your there are little symptoms your inability to trust anyone in authority or anybody in leadership ladies you you cannot trust a man because you've been betrayed before maybe by a father by an uncle by whatever someone broke your heart guys man it can happen to you too all right We have one, someone uh, saved, member in our church who is growing in leaps and bounds. But years back, when we were dealing with the gospel with her, you know, one of the things she said is, Pastor, I don't understand this word. Friends, what does it mean? I was shocked. This person was in college. You know why? Because her own, only concept of friendship was that friends use her. Full stop. They use her when it's convenient. So when Jesus dis call, told his disciples that he tells them that they're friends, she doesn't know what that means. Okay? Now, it was years that I had recurring nightmares as a child. I told someone, I said, I, I had this I joke at times about that. It. It's like I had this fear of fat people. It's not because I'm prejudiced, but I always had this recurring nightmare of being crushed to death by someone sitting on me. It was only in my teenage years that my mother told me that actually, when I was a baby, my cousin tried to bury me under pillows, and by the time they found me, I was blue. I almost died. As a three-year-old, I repeated the same thing. I did that to my sister who was newborn. I had no idea. Okay? Now, 
when I got after that I was saved, you know, that went away. But it was repeating and repeating as nightmares, but I had no idea what, what it was until my mom told me. Then I saw the connection. Okay? Now, realize this. Like Naomi, unless you make a, at some point a conscious, conscious choice to trust the Lord, to take over a very messy situation, because only He is skillful enough to go in, cut into your heart and do the delicate, precise surgery to fix what's broken. The problem is this. You can just move back to Israel and then still be stuck. All right? Whatever issues that may be right now, some of us here ran away from something. And that's why we're here. But if that's the case, can I challenge you, commit to allowing the Lord to start to fix what's broken before you change your circumstances again. Because until what is in the heart changes, the problem will not go away. And the issue is not other people, it's not the circumstances. The issue is how we respond to all those things. Okay? You and I have a choice as to our response. We don't have a choice as to what happens to us. Right? But we all always have a choice as to our response. Why? Because now someone can come right up to me right now and punch me in the face. I still have to choose my response. Whether I will hit them back or kick them or I don't have to do anything at all. Right? And so realize many times our response is the thing that trouble, brings trouble to us. Our response sometimes is not in our, how we retaliate with others. It is how we now drink this poison of bitterness, allow it to go deep inside, and then it's eating away at us. Okay? I just want to end with this thought here. One way to summarize it is this bitterness. It's like when you drink poison, hoping that your enemy will die. Think about that. You drink poison because you want your enemy to die. And that's what we do. Okay? And so, realize this. Let's go back to Hebrews 12. All right? Follow peace with all men. Verse 14. And holiness. Notice, without which no man shall see the Lord. You see that how because of this there are times that God can seem very far away. What do we have to do? It says looking diligent, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Right? We fail to use it, we fail to avail ourselves of it. Someone can go back to the room right now and you take a shower and then you go screaming, ah, it's cold. Why? Not because there's no hot water, but because you did not turn and set the shower mixer to the correct setting. It's not the shower's fault. And we have to avail of the grace of God. Okay, why? Less any root of bitterness. It's something small, something insignificant that most people won't notice unless you look carefully. But if you allow it to grow, it's springing up. What happens? It will bring trouble to you. And thereby, as through this, many others right, be defiled. And just like Esau, you and I can exchange what is our full spiritual inheritance and things that are valuable and, and important instead for short term pleasure and satisfaction. Why? Because bitterness totally changes the way we evaluate things and affects the way we make decisions. Now, so as we close here tonight, right, I mean, sorry, we close this message. You and I have to be honest with God. 
There may be bitterness lurking inside. If you're not sure, then pray and ask for the Lord to show you, is this what it is? Is this what I think it is? Ask the Lord to search deep inside to see if there's still any of that because it will hold you back in your Christian life and in your maturity and your growth. It will hold you back in your service. Right? Even as a pastor, bitterness... Uh, now, a pastor of, of, of in particular will be the one tempted the most with bitterness. Why? Because he's been through a lot of things. And again, unless the Holy Spirit is allowed to be the one to now deal with the pain and the hurt and all that, okay, recovery can be can take a very very long time. Tonight, may, I may be talking to someone here who is under spiritual bondage because of this. You have allowed this to come into your life, and it's holding you back. Tonight will you come? Who tonight will come before the Lord and say, Lord, I come before you. Lord, set me free. All right? Free me from these chains. And then heal me of this bitterness. Okay? Because He can do it. Now, something happened Sometime back, I think there's enough for me to actually be very bitter. And I realized I, as much as I was conscious about trying to deal with it, it was eating at me. Finally, something happened. The person responsible died. God dealt with the matter. The person died. And I told myself, you know, whatever issues there may be, when we lower this person into the grave, they go in there. They're not coming back up. Okay? It's settled. It's over for me. Because if I didn't do it, it will continue eating at me over and over again. I cannot, I will not be of use to the Lord. Some of us here are not letting go. And we, uh, like a bitter person, what happens? We keep repeating, going over and over and over the same story. And we're telling as many people as possible about what happened over and over and over again. It doesn't resolve the matter. Tonight, the place to resolve it is here, on your knees, before the Lord. Right? Determine tonight that when you walk away from that, this place, that it will never hold you back, it will never be a chain again, and you will leave it there as you go back to your seats. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson. And I pray and ask, Lord, it's as simple and, and, uh, and as lesson as it may be, there are things here that are very important that require a searching of the heart. Lord, we recognize and acknowledge that these are things that have hindered many of us from being fruitful for Thee. I pray and ask, Lord, right now, that in this time of invitation, that you help us to come to you honestly, acknowledging that we have no strength or power of our own to fix any of this, but we are badly in need of help today, Lord. We need you, Lord. And I pray and ask for everyone here that we will be honest with you to allow you to search us out, and then if there is anything here tonight, that we will come and say, Lord, I am not well, Lord. I'm not doing well. I'm broken inside, Lord. But Lord, I come before you tonight at this altar, trusting that you alone have the wisdom and the skill to fix what is broken. And Lord, I pray and ask that you help each and every one of us to determine that when we come Whatever it is that we lay there at the altar, we're not taking back. We'll leave it here. And just as you have carried our sins and burdens at Calvary, Lord, we ask that you carry all this on our behalf. We need your grace.
Help us, Lord. Or we will never grow or move forward and we can never be truly fruitful for you. Help us. We ask this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor?